biggest disappointment in the 2024 election cycle is not an individual candidate or campaign. It is the Seattle Times editorial board. This segment is brought to you by Eastside Weight Loss Clinic. Sick of fad diets that work for a couple months and then you gain all the weight back? Well, I'm down 37 pounds on the Eastside Weight Loss Clinic program and I've kept that weight off for more than a year. Schedule your free 15 minute consultation today at eastsideweightlossclinic.com. I have no issue with people disagreeing with me. I have no issue with the Seattle Times editorial board disagreeing with me. I disagree with them often, they disagree with me. It's fine, it's healthy. Wonderful, wonderful, healthy discourse. Uh, I have no issue with them endorsing candidates I don't like, like Bob Ferguson. I have no issue in principle with them opposing initiatives that I support, et cetera. So, so that's not what bothers me. What bothers me is that they have abdicated their highest responsibility. They have abdicated, in the name of ideology, their greatest duty to you and that is to hold powerful people accountable. So that is why the Seattle Times editorial board is such a disappointment to me in this very, very critical election year. Now we've given a few examples of this um, before I get to the latest example. They endorsed Bob Ferguson for governor, despite the fact they called him petty, pushy, overly ambitious, and said it seems like everything he's done in his political life has been leading up to a run for the governor's office. They endorsed Bob Ferguson, despite the fact that they have routinely and repeatedly knocked him for being completely um, lacking transparency uh, on critical issues, racking up millions of dollars in fines for taxpayers because he's incapable of following public records laws or, or discovery in, in cases. So. They have this story where they endorse him despite all of these failures, despite all the ways that he's abused his power and let down his constituents. Another example, Superintendent of Public Instruction, Chris Rakedahl. The Seattle Times begrudgingly endorsed Chris Rakedahl for four more years as the chief of our public school system after what they characterize in the endorsement as eight failed years. They talk about how low test scores are, how there's financial issues, how the public school system is just in utter disarray, but because the other guy's a Republican, we're gonna give Chris Rakedahl four more years and we're gonna suggest our readers vote for him. So that's what I mean, the difference between having ideological differences and allowing elected leaders, powerful people to abuse that power and as the media not holding them accountable. Now, what I said the Seattle Times editorial board should have done, my expectation would be to say, look, Bob Ferguson, you know, ideologically, from a policy perspective, we might agree with him, but if we endorse him, isn't that signing off on all these bad things he's done? Isn't that signing off on his abuse of power, his lack of transparency, his lack of care or concern for public safety? So how could we do that if we're a media entity and we exist to hold the powerful accountable? Why would we take a position in that race? Ideologically, we like his ideas, but as a leader, he's let people down. The same with Chris Reichdahl. They might say, ideologically, we think that he is more aligned with us, but we've already acknowledged that test scores are horrible. This is the public school system's in financial ruin because people are taking their kids out of school or they're not enrolling. So how can we, in, how can we reward the poor job he's done by giving him an endorsement. So that's where the Seattle Times editorial board has completely lost me. They could just as easily decide we're not going to issue endorsements of elected leaders who have failed fundamentally at their jobs for the past eight years, 12 years. Even if we agree with them from a policy perspective, because if we do that, then we're no good as, as journalists, as members of the media. Then we're, again, we are falling short of our obligation to our readership. But the Seattle Times just did the exact same thing when it comes to Initiative 2117. The Seattle Times editorial board recommends keep Washington's Climate Commitment Act vote no on Initiative 2117. So I saw that not necessarily a surprise, but again, they did the exact, it's the same pattern from the Bob Ferguson endorsement to the Chris Regdahl endorsement, where they acknowledge some of the lies and the deceit around the Climate Commitment Act, but they tell voters, keep it anyway. 
And what kind of message does that send? So a couple things I'm going to read from this endorsement. It says, Waterways are warming. A statewide drought and lackluster snowpack have wreaked havoc on the state's farmers, fish populations, and even hydroelectric power generation. Ever drier forests are increasingly at risk of more frequent and intense fires. July marked the fourth consecutive month of global record high temperatures. A ballot initiative asks voters to gut the state's ambitious and necessary response to this growing crisis and prohibit any similar solution in the near future. Voters should reject the appeal. Now, here's the issue. Again, if you truly believe, which I would hope that the Seattle Times editorial board does, that their fundamental responsibility is to hold powerful people accountable, at this, at the endorsement meeting, at the endorsement interview, when the pro and con side for Initiative 2117 sat in front of the Seattle Times editorial board, the Seattle Times editorial board asked those in favor of the CCA, do you have anything to prove that the Climate Commitment Act is actually helping the environment? Do you have any metrics, any tracking? Here's what they were told. How are you tracking? You know, I mean, you preserve some forest land that captures carbon. People replace um, their gas furnaces with um, heat pumps. How are you keeping track of those kind of things? Yeah, we don't have like a system yet that sort of tallies up all of the CO2 reductions from every investment that we make. So some of the investments are, you know, we've invested in, in stronger air quality monitoring networks throughout the state. There's not going to be a direct greenhouse gas benefit from having more accurate information about what air quality is in South Tacoma, but it is something that, that our, you know, elected members of the legislature think is important. So despite being told directly to their face, we're not tracking the potential impacts. We haven't come up with a way to do that, or we haven't implemented a way to do that. And a lot of this money is being spent on things that won't have an actual impact on emissions, which we told you on the show last week when we informed you that $14 million in the money that you were taxed at the gas pump because of the Climate Commitment Act went to climate justice initiatives, most of them in South Seattle. So the Seattle Times editorial board is told to their face, no, we're not tracking it. Yet they turn around and in their endorsement, they say, all oh, these horrible things are happening to the climate and this, the CCA is the only thing that can save us. It's ambitious and necessary, despite being told to their face by the people who like the CCA that, well, actually we can't track it. Doesn't that seem off to you? And then they go on and I thought, well, will they call out the lies about it? Here's what they said. Governor Jay Inslee was wrong to insist the Climate Commitment Act would add pennies to the cost of gallons of gas. When prices peaked above $5 a gallon last summer as refineries passed on the cost of allowances, Haywood's initiative was born. Drivers and truckers had every reason to be peeved and concerned. Lawmakers can and should do more to relieve that pain at the pump through rebates to residents and businesses. So here's what the Seattle Times editorial board is saying. It's okay to lie to people. The ends justify the means. Think about that as a media organization saying it's okay for the highest elected official in the state to lie to people, to hurt them financially, to lie to them in the process knowingly. And we're still going to support the policy that you lied about. What message does that send Governor Jay Inslee or future governors of the state of Washington? If they want a policy bad enough, all they have to do is lie about it. And the Seattle Times will not call them out on their falsehoods. I'll just read one more passage from the Seattle Times endorsement. Um, well, not endorsement. It's an endorsement of the CCA, but they want you to vote no on I-2117. What are we going to do? We're going to vote yes, pay less. They said, as a draconian all or nothing proposition, Initiative 2117 is an inflection point. Either Washington will lead or abdicate entirely its leadership on climate change. Voters should defeat Initiative 2117. Perhaps that's where I got the word abdicate stuck in my head today. Washington, either Washington will lead or abdicate entirely its leadership on climate change. But again, what leadership has that been? Is it leadership to implement something and then lie about the impacts to the people you serve every single day? Is that the Seattle Times editorial board's definition of leadership? If it is, then, then that's the problem right there, is they have a very low bar for the people who are elected to serve their constituents. Is it leadership to issue $200 bribes to energy customers to try to convince them to keep the CCA and then act like it's not a bribe at all when it very clearly is? Is that the Seattle Times editorial board's definition of leadership? 
I've said it a million times before, if you have to lie about a policy, the chances are it's not a good policy. But in doing this, the Seattle Times editorial board has decided to put ideology above, of its, above its core responsibility to people and say, well, you know, you can lie because you lied about something that we like. And that's a pretty dangerous precedent to set. Now, thankfully, there is someone else who writes about climate issues who has an ounce of independent thought and a brain and doesn't like or let ideology get in the way of how they view the, the climate industry, the industrial complex, and yeah, the very real issues related to the environment and climate. I'm talking, of, of course, about Cliff Mass. He's a UW climate scientist, uh, and he uh, issued, and I don't know if his came first or second, I actually think it came before the Seattle Times. Cliff Mass released his endorsement of Initiative 2117, saying if you care about high energy prices, fairness to low income residents, honesty by governmental officials, and effective approaches to dealing with global warming, you should vote yes for Initiative 2117. So Cliff was nice enough to join us today to talk about not only you know reacting to what the Seattle Times editorial board wrote, but to talk about his own position on the initiative. Cliff Mass, welcome back to Undivided. Thank you very much. Yeah, I just went through uh, the Seattle Times saying that its readers should vote no on Initiative 2117. There's a lot of things that stuck out to me in there. Um, what did you make of it? I didn't find it compelling, quite frankly. And I also watched the session in which the Seattle Times editorial staff uh, talked to Hayward and, uh, and to Myers about it. And uh, I think the argument uh, for the initiative is overwhelming. And let's let's dive into that. So you obviously we've had you on before. You care about the climate, you know. You care about the planet, um, but you have seen and pointed out many times some factual inconsistencies in some of the Seattle Times' climate reporting. So when you look at twenty one seventeen and what it would do, why do you not agree with the Seattle Times that that would be detrimental to the environment to repeal CCA? Clearly, the planet is warming, and we're causing part of part of it. I mean, I'm not going to argue with that. Uh, I've done a lot of research on this topic, um, but actually, the effects are relatively subtle. And the Seattle Times has a history of, let's say, hyping and exaggerating the effects. So we start off with some of the claims of these over-the-top effects of climate change, and that's why we have to act so quickly. A lot of those are just not correct and can be proven to be incorrect. So we, we start with that. Yeah. Um, then we have the issue is that this is a very regressive tax and that, you know, low income people are hurt the most. So I mean, that's another issue. There's the issue that people have been deceived by some of the statements of some political leaders suggesting that this would only raise the uh, gas prices by pennies when it actually went up 40 to 50 cents. And then there's the issue that there's the, the money is going all kinds of places and most of them are not going to do much for reining in emissions. It's just not there. And there's no there's no part of this uh, CCA that keeps track of what progress we're making, what impact, what positive impact. Do, do all these programs make? There's no way to track it. There's no way to evaluate it. So I think there's just one weakness after the other for the CCA. And, and I think this initiative is doing good work. Yeah. So to be clear, you are voting yes on Initiative 2117. Um, yes, I, I will vote yes on this. You know, yes. some of the, the, the complaints you have about the Climate Commitment Act, the Seattle Times actually points out in the article, you know, Governor Inslee lying, although they didn't call it a lie. It was a lie uh, about gas prices, for instance. But they are making the argument that we must, in spite of those shortfalls, the impact on gas prices, et cetera, we have to support the Climate Commitment Act because if we pass the initiative, then the legislature will be completely hamstrung from dealing with climate issues in the future. Respond to that. Well, I don't see why that's the case. I mean, the, the legislature could have worked on a number of areas that deal with changes in climate and environmental issues. I mean, a good example is the forest. You know, we, the people are upset about smoke and, and fires. But the truth is, the main issue is on the ground. 
that we've mismanaged our forests for the last 40, 50 years. Uh, invasive grasses are moving in. People are igniting the fires. So, so the real issues really are in climate ones. And the legislature could have dealt with this. The governor could have dealt with this a long time ago. And he hasn't. And they haven't. Uh, on the point you made earlier about there's no, and this was, I think, to me, one of the um, aspects of the Seattle Times Ed Board actual interview that you're able to watch mm -hmm. that stood out to me. You know, they're making these like, and I'm just going to read part of this. This is Seattle Times editorial, you know, talking about waterways are warming, a statewide drought and lackluster snowpack have wreaked, wreaked havoc on farmers, fish populations, da, 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 da. And it says, um, a ballot initiative asked voters to gut the state's ambitious and necessary response to this growing crisis and prohibit any similar solution in the near future. I guess what I struggle with, and I think you alluded to it, is they're saying, like, we have to keep the Climate Commitment Act because of all these environmental issues. But there is no system built into this that tracks outcomes. So I guess how can they make the case that this is essential for our climate if they have no way or are implementing no way to track it? Well, it's even worse than that. Uh, if you want to see what has been the emissions of CO2 by our state, uh, you would think that that would be really important to keep track and keep it up to date. Well, go to the Department of Ecology site and the numbers end in 2019. So for five years, they haven't updated what the emissions have been. So it's am it's, it's amazing. If they were serious about emissions, if they were really worried about emissions, First, they'd find out in real, almost in real time, what we're doing. They're not doing that. And then you'd have the ability to see what the implications of these various programs that they're funding. How much is each of them contributing to reducing emissions? They're not tracking that at all. So that they're not serious about it. Yeah, they That's want the money. They don't want they don't want to track the outcomes because they don't want to be responsible if the outcomes fall short. Um, somebody brought up this issue of the um uh, emissions not being posted since pre-pandemic. Do you know what is stalling them? I I have no idea why it's stalled, why it's stalled. But let's face it: if you're serious about climate change and CO two emissions, you'd be keeping track of this, okay? And they're not. Yeah. So Cliff Mass, make your best pitch to people who, in my estimation, are being fed a lot of lives about the CCA, about the initiative. Um, make your best pitch for people who are on the fence about how to vote on 2117. Well, if you care about climate change, you want effective approaches to deal with it. And clearly, this is not it. Um, I mean, there's all kinds of ways of dealing with climate change, if you were at, 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 at environmental issues. If you care about the forests, well, you want to work on on restoring them to what they were like. Okay, we're hardly doing any of that. Uh, if you want, if you want to deal with climate change, you need to keep track of what's going on. We're not doing that e either. Uh, if you deal with, if you want to deal with climate change, you need to know exactly what's going on, and you need truthful information about what the impacts have been of the minor warming. They're not doing that. They're exaggerating things. Uh, you need to move to technologies that could actually help such as nuclear power. And that's there, we're hardly going anywhere there. Uh, finally, you know, you want to be equitable in the sense that you don't want to penalize poor people, uh, preferentially, and they're certainly doing that. So I I think people who are on the edge, who, who, who worry about the environment and care about the truth, you know, there's good reason not to support what's going on now and therefore to support the initiative. Yeah. Um, I want to end with this because I asked the question of someone else uh, on a, f a few weeks ago on the show, and I, I want to ask it of you, too. You know, Governor Inslee is coming to the end of his time in office, um, will be done with uh, his tenure in January, and he has been the climate governor. You know, he's the climate presidential candidate. Do you believe there'll be a shift in the eagerness to pursue some of these environmental policies when he's out of office, regardless of who replaces him? Well, I can't answer that, of course, but it, let's face it, you know, he, he did make us a centerpiece. And let's face I, I look at this as a great tragedy. This is, he, he cares about climate change. There's no doubt about that. But he has not been effective in dealing with environmental issues and dealing with the forests 
in, in dealing with you know potential ways of, of dealing with climate change so it's really quite unfortunate that he cares so much and he's been so ineffective in just this area yeah wasted time all right cliff mass we appreciate your time and expertise per the usual thanks so much it my pleasure I think one of the reasons Cliff Mass is such an important voice on this because he's dedicated his career to, to understanding the climate, environmental impacts and all of that. Like he's not a climate change denier. He likes to look at things with facts and reason and make sure that there is actual data to back up the arguments that he's making. And oftentimes we've had him on the show before to point out that things the Seattle Times is reporting on are either just steeped in hyperbole or just factually wrong. Uh, and so I think it's significant for someone like Cliff, Cliff Mass to say this um, this major climate proposal of, of Governor Inslee's legacy um, should be repealed. And so he's supporting the repeal and he is going to, as are we, vote yes, pay less on all the initiatives, not just Initiative 2117. <laughs>